In the very early hours of March 23, 1994, a disaster occurred in the Russian Siberian wilderness. A passenger plane seemed to disappear into the night without a trace. Aeroflot Flight 593 crashed on a routine flight between Moscow and Hong Kong, killing 75 people. Extracted data showed the plane plunging up and down several thousands of feet before stalling into the ground. However, it was what was on the cockpit voice recorder which not only piqued the interest of investigators, but also many people across the world. A quick search for Aeroflot Flight 593 on Wikipedia leads to the incident being filed under Untrained Miner in Command of Controls. A child was at the controls of a passenger plane. How? In this video, we will analyze the events of that night, the actions of the flight crew, and the systems of the aircraft involved. To gain more context of the events of that night, we need to understand not only the aircraft flying that night, the Airbus A310, but also the scenario of which the airline, Aeroflot, sought such an aircraft in the first place. This is relevant because of the differences in which certain aircraft systems, in this case the autopilot and primary flight displays, were developed in the Soviet Union compared to Europe and the United States, for reasons we will discuss later. A few years prior to the accident of Flight 593, the old Soviet Union collapsed. A new Russia was forming. During these times of the Soviet Union, Aeroflot had a monopoly in the country's air travel. Even today, Aeroflot is one of the largest airlines in the world, but even in the Soviet Union in the late 1980s, the carrier flew around 90 million passengers per year. This all changed following the 1991 collapse of the USSR. Hundreds of smaller carriers sprang up out of the ashes of the Soviet Aeroflot. The new Aeroflot now had to compete with other carriers. Not only that, the restricted airspace over Russia, which had forced Europe to Asia flights to be routed around Russia, was opened. Aeroflot needed to compete for traffic through to Asia, and thus sought out some new planes to act as the flagship fleet on these routes. The then modern Airbus A310-300 was the ideal plane and only Aeroflot's best pilots were promoted to fly it. The pilots themselves were trained on the A310 courtesy of Lufthansa in Germany. The A310 was introduced in 1983 and the 300 variant in 1985. The plane was one of the most technologically sophisticated planes of its time. Airbus had been experimenting with a new philosophical approach to piloting aircraft and implemented what they call a fly-by-wire system on the Airbus A320 though some fly-by-wire technology made it into the A310. This technology puts more computerized systems in operation of the flight controls on the A310 instead of the traditional flight surface mechanics. It is an immense leap for the Aeroflot pilots who made the switch from the old Soviet planes. The autopilot on the older airbuses, namely the A300 and A310, were made like that to be something similar to Boeing's autopilot, but more on the autopilot system later. The A310 itself being a redesigned version of the A300, Airbus's first passenger plane. The later variants of the A300 feature a cockpit similar to that of the new A310. Aeroflot acquired five of these A310s from Airbus under a lease, all under French registrations. The planes were painted in a new modern livery which was short-lived and was only ever seen on the A310s. One of the pilots chosen to fly the A310 was 39-year-old Yaroslav Vladimirovich Kudrinsky. By the time of Flight 593, he had accumulated 907 hours on the A310. Most of his other 8,000 flight hours came from experience flying Soviet aircraft such as the Aleutian 76, Yakovlev Yak-40, and Antonov-12. On Flight 593, Kudrinsky was to serve as the relief captain. Before we discuss the other flight crew members and the sequential events of the accident, we need to highlight that Captain Kudrinsky on this trip to Hong Kong was bringing his two children, Eldar and Jana Kudrinsky. The ages of Kudrinsky's children varies depending on the source. However, the accident report states that Eldar, the eldest, was 15, while Jana was 13. Mrs. Kudrinsky was staying behind in Moscow on this occasion. The children had accompanied their father on trips before. However, this was to be their first international trip to a new country, 
Going with the Kudrinskys to Hong Kong that evening and accompanying the Kudrinsky children in the cabin was a family friend by the name of Vladimir Makarov, also an Aeroflot pilot. He was off duty, only traveling as a passenger on this occasion. He was also traveling with his daughter. The whole flight crew were as follows. Piloting the Airbus out of Moscow as the captain was 40-year-old Captain Viktorovich Danilov. Like his fellow pilots on board, he is still new to the A310 with just under 1,000 hours logged on the plane. In the right-hand seat was relief captain Yaroslav Kudrinsky, who we have already discussed. He would take over from Captain Danilov and sit in the left seat when he takes his scheduled rest break. Behind the two pilots seated in the jump seat during the first phase of the flight was the first officer, 33-year-old Igor Piskayov. With just 440 hours in the A310, he was the least experienced member of the crew. In the cabin were nine flight attendants and 63 passengers. The cabin was only partly filled as many of the seats remained unoccupied. Aeroflot Flight 593 departed Moscow's Sheremetyevo Airport on March 22, 1994 at 4.39 p.m. local time heading to Hong Kong. It's a flight of around 10 hours. As routine, the plane navigated out of the Moscow airspace climbing to a cruising altitude of 10,100 meters. It should be noted that meters was the unit the flight crew were using in reference to altitude. This was standard in Russia at the time being only one of a few countries which used meters. Even pilots flying in from outside of Russia needed to convert their measurements to reflect this. Programmed into the flight computer was the entire route the plane was to fly along. Waypoint after waypoint in succession, the flight computer interacting with the autopilot was keeping the plane on track to Hong Kong. The recovered cockpit voice recording began recording once the flight crew had switched positions. At some point prior to this, Captain Danilov had left his seat and was out of the flight deck, officially off duty. Likely he was sitting in the cabin. Relief Captain Kudrinsky was in the left seat, while First Officer Piskayov was in the right seat. The time relative to Moscow was approaching 8.30 p.m. The Airbus was midway across Russia with the local time in the Kemerovo region being around 12.30 a.m., the date having now gone into March 23rd. The flight crew had been in communication with air traffic control in Novosibirsk and Novokuznetsk and were passing over the Kemerovo Oblast. It's a region of Russia between Kazakhstan and Mongolia. At around 20 to 1 in the morning local time, Vladimir Makarov, who had been supervising the Kudrinsky children in the cabin, opened the flight deck door and himself and the children entered, surprising their father on the job. Prior to 9-11, it was not uncommon for passengers to visit the flight deck, especially children with permission from the captain. Had the events in the following minutes played out differently, this itself would not have been seen as a cause for concern. The children, Yana and Eldar, have been on the flight deck for three minutes. At 12.43, Captain Yaroslav Kudrinsky asks if his 13-year-old daughter wants to sit in the captain's seat. This, even in the days before 9-11, would have been seen as crossing a line to every pilot and aviation expert. There was no formal transfer of the flight controls to the first officer, therefore Kudrinsky was still responsible for the safety and operation of the plane. He had now allowed his 13-year-old daughter to sit in his seat and even allowed her to manipulate the control wheel in what was a major breach in international aviation regulations. Once raising the seat high enough for Yana to feel comfortable, she puts her hands on the control wheel. Captain Kudrinsky then manipulates the autopilot in a way that it would make Yana feel as if she was flying the plane. Kudrinsky switched the autopilot navigation to the heading mode, taking the Airbus off its programmed flight path to fly a specific heading, in this case, left around 10 degrees to heading 102. This banked the plane slightly to give Yana the illusion of flying the plane. The heading was turned back to where it was and the nav mode was re-engaged, putting the plane back on track for Hong Kong. Yana would spend around seven and a half minutes in the captain's seat. In this time, First Officer Igor Piskayov spoke to Novokuznetsk air traffic control about their positioning. Yana then left the captain's seat and 15-year-old Eldar then took over at 12.51. The off-duty Aeroflot pilot, Vladimir Makarov, supposedly videotaped and took photographs, which were later found in the plane's wreckage, confirming further that the children were indeed in the captain's seat. Just to emphasize, there were three Aeroflot pilots on the flight deck who did not raise any concerns about this situation.
Using the same maneuver as he did with Yana, Captain Kudrinsky manipulated the autopilot once again, this time giving Eldar the illusion that he was flying the plane. Captain Kudrinsky interacted differently with Eldar than he did with Yana, by vocally expressing a turn to the left. Eldar turned the control wheel 3-4 to four degrees to the left. He applied a little more pressure to the controls than his sister did, but still the autopilot was in command and was placed into the heading mode once again by his father. The autopilot responded appropriately. The plane banked to the left, and Captain Kudrinsky then turned the plane back to the right on course to Hong Kong by switching back to the nav mode. It was what happened next when things changed, as Eldar continued to apply pressure on the controls, this time to the right, following the autopilot command. Now back in navigation mode, the controls to Eldar would appear to become stiff. He applied a bit more pressure to the controls. For research of this video, I found myself digging deeper down into the rabbit hole that is the A310 systems. I have watched and listened to multiple documentaries and presentations on this incident and read plenty of written sources, which state that the pressure that Eldar put on the control wheel disconnected or declutched a part of the plane's autopilot, the part which controls the ailerons. Therefore, the plane's role was now in manual control. This explanation is not wrong, and it is what a lot of sources say. However, I know that there is more to it than that. The accident report available had not helped me much, as it is A, an English translation, and so some detail may have been lost during that conversion process, and B, only 22 pages, which by the standards of most major accident reports is very short, and did not give the level of technical detail I desired. So I reached out for some help and spoke to some people who may know more about the A310's autopilot than I ever could understand. I reached out to the developers of the fateful simulated reconstruction of the plane built for the X-Plane Flight Simulator. Inibuilds developed this piece of software from the ground up, simulating and modeling the plane's systems, cockpit, autopilot, and logic. If there are people outside of Airbus who know the most about this aircraft, then this was a good place to look. I will leave a link in the description of this video if you want to learn more about them and their products. After getting some more information, here is how I interpreted what happened to the autopilot on Flight 593. The autopilot on the A300 and A310 were built to be more comparable to a Boeing autopilot than anything that Airbus has produced since the Airbus A320 in the late 1980s. It has two modes to which it is governed. Up till this point, Flight 593's autopilot was in command mode, CMD. In command mode, there is a force limit on the manual roll functionality, which when exceeded on the control wheel by Eldar, had reverted the autopilot to a state of control wheel steering, CWS. This disconnected the autopilot from the roll axis and allowed the pilot, or in this case, 15-year-old Eldar Kudrinsky, to manipulate the roll with the help of the autopilot. Many Boeing planes have this CWS functionality and is jokingly referred to by some Boeing pilots as Airbus mode. Eldar had exceeded the arbitrary force boundary set by default by Airbus and could now manipulate the plane's ailerons freely and thus the roll axis. The autopilot was still however in control of the pitch and yaw axis and thus would try to keep the plane level in altitude as the plane continued to bank. I hope that makes sense. I have stressed trying to wrap my head around the A310, which I have come to learn is a far more convoluted plane than I expected, and I am still not 100% sure if that is correct. Moving on. Yana, now possibly sitting in a jump seat, had distracted Captain Kudrinsky and for a time was not monitoring Eldar's actions. Captain Kudrinsky and First Officer Piskayov gained their flight training and the majority of their flying experience flying Soviet-built planes. Many Soviet planes, such as the popular Tupolev 154, the most abundant plane to ever come out of the Soviet Union, have a distinctive sound for when the autopilot mode changes. The Airbus A310, while it does have an autopilot disconnect audio alert, does not have one for when the ailerons are declutched from the autopilot. The pilots, thinking if something abnormal were to happen to the autopilot, would likely have expected some kind of alert. In this case, they received no such thing. Neither Captain Kudrinsky or his first officer noticed that the autopilot had switched from command to CWS, and that the ailerons were now disconnected. Eldar, with his hands on the control wheel, 
inadvertently began slightly banking the plane more over to the right. He has been in the captain's seat for just under four minutes. This is the cockpit voice recording from the flight deck during this time. The plane had begun banking increasingly over to the right. Eldar had no flight training whatsoever and was unable to identify that the plane was acting abnormally. The flight crew instead pay more closer attention to the navigation display as the plane appeared to be behaving in a way similar to that if it were entering a holding pattern, at least according to what the off-duty Aeroflot pilot thought. Instead, Eldar had turned the plane himself, but they believed that the autopilot was controlling the plane, not Eldar. Things quickly go from abnormal to very bad very quickly. As the plane banked beyond its design limits, gravitational forces made it difficult for those inside the plane to move. Eldar, a child, was the only person on the flight deck with both hands on the flight controls. The Airbus A310 overbanks, shutting off the autopilot completely as you will hear from the autopilot disconnect. This sound was the autopilot disconnect. The autopilot was no longer governing any aspect of the aircraft. Both command and control wheel steering modes have been disengaged. In other words, it was now under full manual control, to which Eldar Kudrinsky was the sole person in control of. Prior to this, the autopilot command was still in control of the pitch axis and raised the nose to keep the plane on its programmed altitude, but at this extreme angle, it cannot maintain said altitude thus disconnecting, and the plane begins to drop. Flight 593 entered a steep dive plummeting thousands of feet. The extreme gravitational forces had now pushed everyone in the plane back into their seats, making it incredibly difficult to move. As he was the only person with their hands on the controls, Eldar was receiving instructions from his father as he could not retake his seat at this time. First Officer Piskayov was also giving instructions, sometimes contradicting Kudrinsky. Eldar himself also could not leave the captain's seat. The accident report notes that as Captain Kudrinsky said, hold the control column, investigators believe Eldar could have interpreted this literally and thought his father meant to hold the control column in a neutral position, when in fact he needed to counter the bank. The first officer could not reach the controls initially, but was soon able to have some grasp of the control wheel but was still limited in his ability to fly the plane. In the cabin, Captain Danilov, who had left the cockpit on his rest break, would now likely have wanted to make his way back to the flight deck to understand what was happening to his plane. He too could not leave his seat. The time was now 12.56. The Airbus was pulled out of its initial dive as Piskayov manages to pull back on the controls getting the plane to climb. By this point, everyone in the flight deck would have lost lateral spatial orientation. In these moments, Piskoyov overcorrects and the Airbus begins to climb at an exceedingly high rate. The plane here, for a brief moment, had slowed and Captain Kudrinsky was able to switch seats with his son. Once both pilots are back in their appropriate positions, the Airbus stalls, beginning a spin before it re-enters a dive. The pilots would apply maximum thrust, with Captain Kudrinsky applying rudder movement to try and stop the plane from spinning. 
For a moment, in the flight's final seconds, it would appear the pilots had regained control as they slowly bring the plane out from its fall, but they had simply run out of time and altitude. Aeroflot Flight 593 crashed into a densely wooded hillside at 12.58 in the morning, some 85 kilometers southeast of Novokuznetsk. All 75 people on board were killed. Investigators at the crash site discovered that passengers were evidently prepared for an emergency, indicated by the usage of the seatbelts. Initially, the crash puzzled investigators as it appeared to them that there was at least one child in the flight deck. When they recovered the cockpit voice recorder, the tape spoke for itself as the conversations between Captain Kudrinsky and his children evidently told the investigators the series of events which unfolded. Investigators and aviation experts were left stunned by the revelations. Following the disaster, new pilot training was introduced to increase cockpit discipline. Recommendations were made to Aeroflot and the Russian civil aviation sector as a whole to improve safety. Aircraft manufacturers, especially Airbus, now develop ways that allow aircraft to not exceed their banking design limits and autopilot disconnecting from the ailerons without any warning. It is also believed that the spatial disorientation in nighttime conditions, coupled with the fact that the pilots did not have much experience flying western planes, also contributed considerably to the crash. The pilots had flown for most of their flying careers Soviet-built planes, which used slightly different displays, most notably on the attitude indicator. These differences, however, will be discussed in another video. There is one more key point of interest to make with this video in relation to the accident. You see, when researching Aeroflot Flight 593, you inevitably come across a piece of information which stipulates that if the pilots had simply let go of the controls during the chaos, the plane would have corrected itself because the A310 was equipped with that kind of technology. Despite my best efforts to back this up with consistent sources, I simply can't. Sources seem to be contradicting. The accident report does not come to this conclusion. Evidence from other sources and online discussions that I could find seem to suggest that no such technology exists on the A310. I believe this is sourced from a 2005 documentary on the matter. However, after poring over other sources, I must leave this question up to experts and pilots of the A310 to answer, the A310 being a plane which has now largely been retired from passenger service. Hi everyone, I hope you are doing well today. Thank you once again for watching this video. I know I already made a video on this incident around five years ago, but I always knew since doing this full time that I could make a much better video of it. And here we are with a video three times the length of the original with much more detail. I'm thinking of doing something similar to the Korean Airlines 007 video and maybe the Helios video as well. Let me know if those videos are something you want to see. Even though you can call this a remake, I have not let it get in the way of new content for lack of better terms as there will be another Disaster Breakdown video coming this Tuesday on October 19th. Anyway, if you found this video to be interesting, be sure to subscribe as there is always a new video every Saturday. And if you want to support me further, consider joining the Disaster Breakdown Patreon. Joining means that you get early access to all videos 48 hours before they go out on YouTube. And you can also have your name featured or read out here at the end of the next video.
And with that, I will move on to thanking my £5 tier patrons, Avery Tioda, Aaron Wilson, Hector Palmatellas, Ken Zachman, Kenneth Morens, Christy, Leon San Jennings, Marie Ennis, Mom Left Me at Best Buy, MG, Pac-Man 7, Panic Chicken, Pedro Cruz, Rebecca Rivers, Rez, a new joiner, Rio Wheatley, I hope I said that right, and as a new joiner, Surya Melody, Sleepy, So FP, and Su So Su Shoes. Of course, a big thanks to my incredible £10 tier patrons for their generous support. Ada Montgomery, Anne Sid, Daniel Hendricks, Derek Bean, James Bluke, also another new joiner, Karma, Mike Milton, Side Effect, Roger Mayer, Steve Cottrell, and Where Are My Cheetos? Thanks to everyone who has been supporting the Patreon over the course of this year. We are roughly 10 months in, and I can't thank you all enough. Anyway, I must say goodbye for now, but I will be back on Tuesday with another video. So until then, goodbye.